So I want you to do me a favor. I want you to pull out your Bibles. And I want you to go to John chapter 14. Because some of you know and some of you might not know because you just walked in this morning and and are now carrying this heaviness. But I I want to lead us forward because there's something even amidst this that's going on that, that I think is important. We started a series three weeks ago and we said we have to understand. We have to be those that are perceiving why we're here. Why the capital C Church is here. That the question why is so important because it gets at the heart, it gets at the motivation, it gets at the thing that should get you out of bed in the morning, and if you don't know the answer to that question, then the rest of the world should be asking, why are you waking up? Why does it matter? In the Capital C Church, we took three weeks and walked through, and it's not exhaustive by any means, but it's at least some pillars in the road that we can say, okay, if that's true, then there's some implications. And we started, and we said, okay, why are we here Paul says in 1 Corinthians 9, uh, to save some, by any means, no matter what it takes, we'll be so other-minded that it doesn't matter who I am, that I'll become what what I need to become, that I can save some. And the week after that, we talked about the spiritual warfare, that there is a war raging and we are called to wage war, not like the world wages war. But we are to stand. We are to know what we stand for and know what posture we are to stand in. That is why we are here, to wage that battle. What we just did. Well, this is not how the world wages battle. This is how we wage battle. Concerted, spiritual, believing, concerted prayer. And then we continued forward last week and asked the question that we will continue to ask is are we called to be uh, missional or just to do missions? And wrestling with is the the call of God, the the missio dei, as we used that language last week, the mission of God, if he is by nature missional, then then shouldn't we be? Shouldn't we stop with the checklist and we did church today so now we can go do life? Or are we to be missional in our very DNA? That everything that we are and everything that we do should have the mission of God, the movement of God at its roots and at its core. So then we take another step because those are great and those are really powerful things for us to breathe in, but it has to get local at some point. So what is Providence doing here? What is Providence United Methodist doing here at the corner of Sharon Amity and Providence, primo location, What are we doing here? Why are we here? And several years ago, our church council went through a very long, rigorous process to come up with what what we deemed our vision statement, the things that we would see visioning out of our mission. And it was loving God, worshiping boldly, and changing lives. So my question to that and my question to us is, well, what does that mean? What does that mean for us to be about that. So that's what we're going to do for the next three weeks, is to get very local. And the message this morning is very, very simple, so don't miss it. But it's going to come out of John chapter 14, verses 15 through 21. Hopefully you've had time to get there, but I want to give you this leading thought. I try to do this sometimes just to give us a strand, right? So this is a leading thought that even as we prayed this morning, even as I was thinking about this week, I think is really, really important. Maybe one of the biggest answers to a question that we can have. Leaning thought is this. Our love for God, when we talk about loving God, our love for God should not be a descriptive word with adjectives. It should be a directive with implications. So let's now look at the scripture. If you've had a moment to get there, John 14, I'm going to read you about six verses, starting in verse 15. Jesus says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. The spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him or knows him, but you know him. For he lives with you 
and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me because I live, and you also will live. On that day, you will realize that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Whoever has my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love them and show myself to them. Let's prep our hearts real quick. Let's, let's pray just one more time. Get, get our heads right. Father, a big morning, a heavy morning, but your word pierces, pierces darkness. The double-edged sword, man, that thing cuts and brings light. So give us that light this morning. We ask you to come and speak through the power of your Holy Spirit. May these words be yours. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. How many of you know that context is really important? Do I say this every week? I try to. How many know that context when you're reading your Bible is really important? Okay? Context. I need you to know the context of what this is because you pull this verse out and it says something. You're like, oh, that's interesting. And you kind of move on with your life. But context is important no matter where you're reading in Scripture. Okay, this piece of Scripture This chapter of John is in the midst of what's known as the farewell discourse of Jesus. Chapters 14 through 17 of John is Jesus' farewell speech, time, that he has with his disciples. Because in just a few chapters, he's about to be betrayed, he's about to go to the cross. And and in this time are some of the most richest pieces of scripture. All of chapter 17 is a prayer. Okay, you think I pray a lot. Jesus took a chapter of the Bible. And said, let me show you, let let, let me pray something over you that's going to echo and echo and echo and echo and echo. Because it's not just a prayer for the 12 guys seated around or however many were sitting in that room. It was for all who would one day believe. And so in the midst of that, in chapter 15, he lays out something pretty significant. And if you think about it, Jesus has been loving and living and caring and teaching and preaching and showing these, these 12 disciples and, and hundreds more, but with these very specific ones, living life for three years, and he's just told them he's leaving. I love you. I've been with you. But I'm leaving. And the disciples are like freaking out. I mean, wouldn't you? Wouldn't you? I mean, knowing what you know about Jesus, you're like, dude, Jesus, you're like 33, bro. Like, you got time. You ain't going anywhere. In their brains, there's fear. There's anxiety. There's, well, what are we going to do now? What are we going to do now? What, what are we going to be called to do upon your departure? Because we're not you. We, we don't know how to do this. We're watching you, we're, we're trying to learn, but obviously as we know, looking backwards, man, they, they messed up everywhere. So there's fear, there's anxiety, and Jesus is attempting to give them great news and releasing some of the truest, deepest, most life-changing truths about who he is and about who his father is, that they don't know it probably as they're hearing, maybe, I don't, I don't know, but it was going to be something they would have to cling to upon Jesus' departure. Asking the question, what will be true about you, disciples, in relationship to me once I'm gone? Okay, so then we got to unpackage this text. And I'm going to focus really intently on verse 15, and the rest kind of unpackages it, but really intently on that first verse. So if you have your Bible, keep keep looking back at it, okay? I didn't just want to read you one verse and, and go there. I want you to see it in its context. Well, what does he say? He says, if... Say, if. If you love me. Has anyone ever started a sentence like that with you? Spouses, you ever say that to your husband or husbands, you ever say that to your wife? It's not good. Because if you loved me, I don't know if that laundry would be undone over there. Hey, if you loved me, you'd let me go get my nails done, right? If you loved me, it's a conditional, it's a, it's a condition setting. All right, he's starting this thing, right? What, what's interesting is if you think about the audience that he's, he's saying this to his disciples, which have kind of followed him, have kind of done some incredible things, even to, to show up to this point, what's going on, 
right? Dropping nets, leaving households, stepping out of their old life into a a discipleship type relationship with Jesus. They've already kind of done a lot, and he's going, but if you love me, if you love me, if, then there's going to be some implications. So what does he say? You'll do if you love him. He says, you, if you love me, you're going to keep my commands. You're going to keep my commandments. And now, interestingly enough, there's a little bit of debate if we take this out of context. Like, okay, like like the 400 or 500 in in the Old Testament, or is it just the 10? Or like, what, what are we doing? Luckily, if we had read the whole thing together, you would have seen that just verses before in in chapter 13 he said this a new command i give you love one another as i have loved you so you must love one another and by this everyone will know that you're my disciples if you love one another so if you love me if not not if you follow me not if you believe in me not if you go to sunday school not if you Live a good life. If you love me, you will follow my commandments. Okay, what's your commandments? (gasps) That's it? I just have to, like, love everybody? Well, well, okay. What what else does it say? Okay, you you keep moving down there. He says, okay, there's a condition. If you love me, um, uh, you'll follow my commands. And, there's a connector in the next verse, and, so it actually, in the Greek, if you were to read it, this would kind of flow together. If you love me, you'll follow my commands, and what am I going to do? I'm going to do something for you. I'm going to give you an advocate. Have we talked about this advocate recently? Anybody that's been here? Have we talked about the Holy Spirit at all? About his power, about his mission, about why he's in us, about, okay, this is a big deal. If you love me, then you're going to follow my commands, And I will go to my Father, and he will send you an advocate, the spirit of truth that the world cannot accept. Okay, Jesus is putting out some pretty deep dividing lines. Okay, there's several moments where it's they won't know, or they won't see, or they won't understand, but you will. They won't see me, but you will. They won't understand the Holy Spirit, but you will. If you love me, if you love me, You will follow my commands, and God will not leave you. Uh, That's a promise. If you love me, follow my commandments, and God will never leave you. He'll never leave you. Isn't that good news to hear today? That's not the, the, the center of this message, but isn't that good news to hear today? Man, earthly love, we love some things, they go away. Sometimes we love some things that don't really stand up or, or hold up in that tough moment. God says, Listen, I am not leaving you. You might deserve to be left, but I'm not leaving if you love me. And then he says, The one that keeps my commands loves me. He, he, he starts and ends, right? He's saying, If you love me, keep my commands. All this amazing promises, I'm gonna be with you and, and the Spirit, and, and then says, The one who keeps my commands loves me. Okay, buttons it together. It's like a nice little sandwich for you. Because we, if we love, we keep his commands. And if he loves me, you're going to be loved by the Father, you're going to be loved by me, and I'll show myself to them. I'm going to show myself. I'm not going to stay hidden. I'm not going to be like in a box somewhere. I'm going to show myself the fullness of who I am to you, And there are going to be some implications to that because the conclusion of this text, the conclusion of just this portion, front, back, middle, that there's only one test of love, and it's obedience. Well, that doesn't like, that's not like warm and fuzzy. But Jesus just said, if you love me, You'll obey my commands. You'll follow my commands. You'll keep my commands. There is only one test of love. It's obedience. So, so while that's not warm and fuzzy, let, let, me, let, me, let me bring you along a journey because love, like we don't have 
hours enough to unpackage what that actually means, but let's just take a look down history lane of what Christians have done while loving Jesus and loving neighbors. Number one, did you know that the first college came through Christians? Anybody heard of Cambridge University? 1284? 1284 A.D.? They said, we need to figure out a way to educate our people because that's really important because that's going to better their lives and that's going to give them an opportunity and that's going to fill in the blank. Bishop of Eli did that. The first hospital. You know those things that you like drive by all the time? There's uptown, downtown, overtown, west town, market. All, okay, there's like uh, hospitals everywhere. First one was 660 A.D. Born out of these women, these like monk women, who said, we have a lot of people to take care of. Compelled by Christ to care for the least of these, they said, we, we need to do this better. Because there's a lot of people in need. Disaster relief. I actually couldn't count and figure out all of the ones that were started by Christian organizations, but it's tens of thousands. Some of the bigger ones. World Vision, Samaritan's Purse, Compassion International, World Relief. I actually found out that the Red Cross at its truest beginnings actually came out of a Christian heart. Like Sweden. But for the record, I, they, they have stuff on their website. I don't want to misquote. Did you know that Christians were instrumental in the establishment of the United Nations? Anybody think that that like, is something necessary in today's like, world right now, that the role that the United Nations is playing and continues to play? It was started by Christians, a coalition that came around and said, hey, it would probably make sense to do this. They helped with the drafting of some of the language that went into their charter. This one hits super, super close to home. Christians are more than twice as likely to adopt children that are in need. Christians are more than twice as likely to adopt those that are in need. You know how I know? Because there was a Barna study done in like 2012 that the national average was about 2%. 2% of Americans, just, just broad-based. But 5%, I know that in 5% in our brains, like, oh, that's not a lot. That's more than double the national average. Do you know why? Do you know why Christians feel compelled to adopt? James 1, 27. Religion that God our Father, and this is, like, you know, Jesus' brother, James. Religion that, our, that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and keep to oneself from being polluted by the world. Compelled by the love of Christ that they've received, uh, Christians across the nation, 5% of those polled versus 2% that, that don't, more than double said we need to care for those who can't care for themselves. So we're going to adopt. And I told you even last week, I didn't even know the statistic last week, and I told you a week and a bit ago we hung out with a family that's doubling the amount of kids in their family. They have two, they're adopting two from Uganda because they said, compelled by the love that we have and have received, we're going to do this. So, if I were to return to the leading thought, our love for God should not be a descriptive word with adjectives, it should be a directive with implications. So what does that mean? If, if it's a ethereal adjective, kind of, yeah, I just love God, like God's like really cool, and he's a really loving God, or we start to fill in other adjectives about who he is, about how great he is, and, and the words we'll talk about it, we'll proclaim it, we'll keep saying things, but the problem with saying things is that no one's actually impacted if it stays there, that the love that we've received, that we just poured out for the first 35 minutes of this time we had together, that if it just stays as proclamation, just stays as words, it doesn't actually help anyone. In fact, if, though, it's a directive with implications, then that means that I, I have the Holy Spirit within me. 
That means that like I'm not alone, that I'm taking those promises, I'm, I'm owning those promises in Scripture that, that I love Jesus, I, I love God, and I'm going to follow his commandments, so he's with me, I'm full of the Holy Spirit. Jesus has shown himself to me, shown himself to be real, tangible, in love with me, pursuant of my heart, pursuant of the hearts of those that are around me. Well, eventually, eventually that truth is going to impact everything that I do. Eventually, the implications of my love for Jesus and my love for the Lord will have implications that impacts everything that I do. What I'm saying is, the world will be a better place because I loved Jesus. Even if it's one person. Even if it's one person. I'm okay with that. That the world will be a better place. So let's, let's bring this down a couple of others. Okay, my city. This is for you to wrestle with and declare. My city will be a better place. The city of Charlotte will be a better place because I love Jesus. The city will be a better place because we love Jesus together. Because out of that are going to be implications. My marriage will be better because I love Jesus. My marriage will be better because I love Jesus. My family will be better because I love Jesus. My kids will be raised in a love that is beyond me because I love Jesus. Businessmen. Your businesses will be better because you love Jesus. Doctors, your hospitals will be better because you love Jesus. Kids, look at me. Your schools, they're going to be better because you love Jesus. They will. It's a, it's a, it's a fact. You can't help. When you love the Father, when you love his Son, the Spirit is now within you. And everyone is impacted. The world would be a better place if Providence United Methodist Church loves God well. Loves him. So here's my question. Do you? I know that's anticlimactical. Do you? Do you love Jesus? Do you love the Father? The beautiful part is you don't have to answer that to me. <laughs> we can have coffee about it. We can talk about it. I'd love to. But Jesus says, Jesus speaking through his words. You just picked it up. It's sitting in front of you. If you love me, you will follow my commands. So are we ready to do that together? Are we ready for the world to be a better place, for Charlotte to be a better place, for our families and our church community to be a better place because we love God well. If you don't yet, let's talk. Let's talk. Because he loves you so much. As we sang before, pursue you to the ends of the earth he will. Reckless love. And all he says is just love me back. Amen. Would you stand? Let's worship together.